next panel discussion is called Denim, Cotton and the Water. And before we dive into the subject, let me pre um, welcome the panel on stage. <laughs> okay, I'm going to start with you, global networker and strong believer of changing the fashion industry for good. Uh, global Fashion Exchange is an international platform for promoting sustainability in the fashion industry uh, with swapping him. He's the founder of GFX, Patrick Duffy. Welcome. Yes. Another denim brand handmade in Italy since 1978, a German denim designer with a passion for making premium jeans with the lowest possible footprint while being the most intriguing on the market. Uh, from the brand closed, Uwe Kipschneider. And a Swiss passionate pioneer for organic cotton with an extensive experience over 30 years in building a super sustainable organic cotton supply chain, owner and CEO of Remai, Patrick Hohmann. Here we have a long-time exhibitor at the Neonit Fairtrade and a passionate denim head, founder and managing director of the organic denim brand Good Society, Dietrich Weigel. And we've uh, changed the program a little bit. We have the sales director uh, of Ital Ital Denim, Bruno van den Wege, and he's also a denim expert. He's been with the company since 2007, so you know all about uh, Ital Denim. So, um, yeah, that's your applause. Thank you for coming, and thank you for um, hopping in. So I'm going to start. Um, Start with you, uh, Patrick, since you're ex uh, experienced, and um, we're going to put it uh, in, into context. Uh, you, your movie, Fair Traders, was shown right here uh, where we're sitting now two days ago as, starting, as a starting, pound, starting point for the Neonit. Um, in that video, we learned that you have been working with organic fat and crops for over uh, forever. Um, is cotton really such a thirsty plant? Can you? Tell us a little bit about that to start off. Cotton, cotton is a very thirsty plant. But when you talk about thirsty, you can have rain thirst, you can rain feed your plant, or you can um, um, water your plant, yes? And when it's rain fed, you need for one kilo of cotton about 16,000 liters water in a poor area. In a, in a rich area where there is a lot of rain, you can reach out with 3,000 liters of water. But when you have to um, water the plants, you use the water to distribute the fertilizer. And then it's not only the water which you are using, it is also the fertilizer which you are using, which is salinating the soils. And therefore, the organic agriculture is an excellent remedy for that because it holds the soil tender and the soil has much higher capacity in um, storing the water. <clears throat> and this is a very, and for, the, for this gene section, I've been thinking about this now lately, this is really, it would be a fantastic thing if the, the gene sector would, would come into these native uh, fibers, which are slightly coarser, they are rain-fed, and by being rain-fed, they would not have any chemicals and pesticides to be used, and this could be a real challenge for the jeans manufacturer. But cotton is a thirsty crop, and we have many, many people who have no other crop which they can, um, with which they can earn their living, and therefore the rain-fed crop is the real crop you need in cotton, and not the watered crop. Yeah, that, that's, an, that's an interesting point. And um, like we we're talking about numbers all the time. Um, 7,000 or Claire said 10,000 liters are being used or you know, just to produce a pair of jeans. So if, um, let's put it into context. What importance do you give cotton for Demonum in the future? I think, I think they can't go without cotton. This is my opinion. But, but uh, they know better. The, the, the industry water use is much less than the growing of cotton in water which we use. 
So the real problem for me is on the cotton agriculture. Mm. On the industrial side, you should not put any poison in the water because every water is poisoned, even if it's only a little bit. And this is the big challenge which they have in this uh, jeans industry. But um, I'm convinced, I cannot imagine myself jeans without having cotton jeans as a choice. <laughs> well, 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 Dietrich, uh, you are uh, only working with organic cotton, so, uh, and since uh, the start of uh, Good Society, as far as I know, uh, <coughs> was, it, was it difficult to go all organic? Honestly speaking, no. Until now, it was not an issue. I'm more concerned about what happened in future, because we have a huge tendency of, uh, of the entire industry. I guess uh, Uwe will definitely will be able to say something to it, to move into organic fibers. And we won't be so quick changing the, uh, um, the cotton farming from conventional to organic. And maybe you have uh, some words to say that I definitely would be interested to know about. Um, consider that every fabric manufacturer, like 2004, 2006, 2000. Uh, seven started to use re organic sustainable fibers in their fabric line and everyone was sure that it will be a very quick thing that the whole industry will move. Uh, Good Society, Armed Angels and some other brands are born in that time due to this uh, understanding of that, uh, that the sense of it uh, it was so very frustrating, and Bruno may say that, that the conventional brands did not use a product. They said, oh, that's more expensive. We, we can't use it. So, uh, uh, and because they think, okay, a better agriculture, a better world somehow, let's say it this way, don't be too polemic, is, is a good thing. We can move to it. So, uh, and we as a brand, and the brands they mostly here exhibit, don't understand why there have been this uh, movement. So we didn't have a problem until now to get our organic cotton because there was enough. We all know it's only 1% from the entire worldwide con uh, cotton production. But I'm looking very seriously into the future, thinking about how the existing cotton will be distributed. To whom and why? So, but this is a question maybe Bruno can uh, give us an answer to. The scarcity of um, organic cotton, you mean? Sorry? The, the scarcity, so there's not enough cotton. Uh, no, there's 1% yeah. of but if every, world production is supply. organic cotton, and even if only a part of it is that type of cotton, this GOTS, what, Mr., uh, what, what Rima is doing, what we consider to be real right. Mm. And when I, I have talked five weeks ago to one of the m biggest manu Danny manufacturers in the world, and I asked the sustainable manager, they have done a brilliant program about uh, uh, sustainable uh, cotton, organic cotton. And she says, yes, it, it must be GOTS. So this is what I think about, but I don't know how that would, should work when we need all the farmings to give us this product. And I'm a, it's very interesting for me to be here to, to understand what do you think, because it takes years to change something. And okay, how we as a, as a relatively small brand can be in this where you have H&M, C&A, whatever already existing. They don't always work with GOTS standards. They work uh, often with other type of organic standards. We have like three major, which maybe you know or you, you can talk about. We have this uh, BSCI, Better Cotton Initiative from Africa, where you can use pesticides, fertilizers to make things work where you have more guarantee for the work site, which is already great because people know we can have a living for all the year and we don't be on the open market to be down, um, down priced because someone else makes a lower price. So we have security and uh, you have uh, cotton made in Africa, which is another one is similar to, to BSCI. So we have three major things, but for us, and for most of the born organic brands, GOTS is the right thing to do. And 
we want, it would be very interesting how to know how in future when a brand like Closed, when a brand like Liu Zhou, Dondap will seriously say, we want to be cotton, we want to be premium cotton, we want to be GOTS premium cotton, that what we always wear, we always said for us, the sustainability is a premium argument. So, and the GOTS is premium. So we want to know where we go. So do you think the whole industry can change to organic cotton or maybe alternatives or a mix or where, can that, where could that lead? In, in everything we have like a transition. We can't be clean from one day to the next. We, we need to say to the consumer, look, this is what we can do now because that's what, what we have as opportunities, as resources. Our goal is to reach that and then, then definitely the, the farmers will change because when Every end consumer understands, oh, this is a certification for the right thing, for the good thing, then they will go for it. And then the, every, every manufacturer, every um, producer of garments has to change. This is a nice thing in fashion. <laughs> <laughs> yes, everybody has to change. For, for, for example, let's, let's hand it over to uh, Bruno. Um, you've been uh, involved in the denim world for, for a long time. And uh, Ital Denim was the first denim manufacturer in the world to undertake the detox screen paste commitment. What made this company do this? Uh, well, in, in the research of um, wanting to be sustainable, um, there is a lot of things that you can do. One thing is indeed the, the raw material, which is the organic cotton in that uh, case, but there's also alternative fibers like we mentioned before. Uh, but there is also not a big step uh, that can be done, which we did, um, which has been mentioned here before in the industry where the jeans cloth is made. Uh, we need to work on uh, less on the water side. Of course, we do also because we already have big restrictions because of the Italian law, the European law, whatever. So we are not really at a Bangladesh level, if you want. But um, what is important, though, is that you don't need really toxic chemistry on your genes to be able to make a nice gene. And that's our big goal, what we went for. And we are, as a matter of fact, as you just said, uh, also the first mill ever, uh, and still probably that is Detox Committed, which is an initiative from Greenpeace that aims to get rid of toxic chemistry in the industry. And that is indeed the big goal that we go for. And uh, we keep on looking for alternatives uh, in uh, that area because you, we are convinced that you can always find alternatives, and that's the whole key. Because if you don't look for it, which is very easy, then you don't find anything. If you look for it, you do find alternatives. Maybe not directly in the textile industry, but for sure looking into it, different industries like the medical world, the cosmetic world, there is a lot of things happening there and where we indeed found resources that we applied in our textile booth and uh, with very, very good results. And there's a lot uh, going on. There's even more going on now in this very moment uh, where we started to um, uh, make the first ever um, chemics, uh, toxic chemical free indigo, which is called smart indigo. Basically, to be able to dye, you need to transform your indigo molecule. Um, uh, and that is up to date, that is done with chemistry, with toxic chemistry, which is basically hydrosulfite and some other stuff. Um, but we found out with a partner that you can do that also with electricity, and that's what we've done. Uh, we have done uh, since three years now, and we're coming out this year officially with that outing that we are dying with Smart Indigo, which will be the benchmark for the market if everything goes as fast as we all think and hope that it will be. Yeah, and the panel, the previous panel, somebody said the technologies are so fast. You know, we have uh, alternatives and we have technologies. Yeah. And, and so I'd like to hand it back over to you, Dietrich. So what are the standards we, we said? Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about what really, um, um, oh, I'm sorry, not Dietrich, uh, Patrick. Sorry, we wanted to hand it over to you. Yeah, I wanted to talk about the standards because there are so many different standards that you can apply. Uh, what, what do you think is the most important one? It's difficult, I know. No, I'm, no, I was, no, I'm paid no. to ask uh, difficult questions. I, I, <laughs> but but, but, but we, are a bit, um, we are a bit outcast, yes? We are a bit difficult. We, we, we believe that organic is organic. It's not a little bit organic. Mm. It's not a little bit 
best. It's not a little, so it's not PCI. It's not cotton made in Africa, but this is our point of view. And, and, uh, <laughs> and, and uh, it's not with GMO cotton, yes, it, it really has to be pure. And it's, it's, it's not big farming, it is, it is slow farming. S slow farming, what does that mean? It, 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 it means the, the human being, the farmer, gets into an interaction with his soil and with surroundings, yes? And, and uh, it's not making money, it's, it's uh, getting the environment healthy. And this is not something which goes fast. And already, if you want to fulfill the regulations, you have to wait for three years until the farmer has agreed into all that, yes? And the farmer who, who, who makes the step forward, he has to revive his soil first, which means he's in a lost position. And he, he can, I can tell you, out of my experience, it takes 10 to 12 years to get, again, a living soil, to get a... a, a biodiversity in again to get to get to get a, a soil which can cope with the nature and the environment so i'm not so much on this um, certification but i understand that everybody needs a certification yes i am convinced that um, a healthy a healthy agriculture creates a healthy social life at the same time mm. and i wish this is my personal wish. I wish this could come through. But this is very difficult. Very, very difficult. And it's not something which will come from today to tomorrow. But it's something which will come if all the responsible people start thinking, I am not only buying a certificate, I'm buying a corporation. I'm buying from a partner. Somebody is producing for me and not just for money. Mm. I think now. Yeah, I would like to hand it over to you, Ove. In what way is cotton still an important fiber for you, for Carlos? I mean, of course, uh, when it comes to denim, it's still the most important fiber is cotton. And um, I think um, at least for the next uh, couple of years, there are no really big alternatives. Um, what we did now, just with the collection uh, we presented at Pity um, the other week, is that um, we extended our range, uh, which is called a better blue, that was introduced a year ago. Um, it's our umbrella for um, our um, sustainable um, technologies in denim. And um, for the first time now, we introduced um, qualities that um, use refibra, so the uh, tensile fiber from lensing. Mm -hmm. And um, we even have one quality in the collection which has no fresh cotton at all. So that means it's 50% refibra and 50% recycled cotton. And um, that cuts down the, um, the amount of water uh, by 2,500 liters or even more per genes. So this is something, of course, uh, we are really um, happy and proud of to have that in the collection and this is for sure something we're going to build up on. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, um, it's also uh, the organic cotton that uh, we will focus uh, now for the next season on. So um, at least for the menswear, um, I'm planning a program which is uh, just based on organic cotton qualities for the denim. So it will be five to six different qualities from gray to, to colored denim to acro denim, of course, to indigo denims, which are 100% uh, or uh, they are, have a stretch content, but the um, cotton content is uh, organic cotton. So, yeah, I think that for denim, it's still super important to, to have cotton, but we are trying to find better solutions as well. And which one is the most promising, like the most sustainable alternative? What will you say when you say, okay, this is our promising aim, this, this fiber? Yeah, as I said, I think um, we got really good results also in terms of the, um, the uh, surface, of the surface. touch of the uh, fabric. And um, what's at least for us is quite important, uh, the wash results. Um, yeah. I mean, we started working on this uh, refibra quality a year ago when it was just released um, from Kanyani. And um, my aim was to have it ready for the summer season, but the washes didn't turn out as we uh, were looking for. So we skipped another season and really uh, went into the development with uh, Everest, which is, I guess, one of the best laundries in Italy uh, we work with. And um, now, 
just a, a year later, we managed to get exactly the results so that we can um, include it in our collection. So, um, but I think this is uh, something, once you know how to treat uh, a fabric uh, like that and how to handle that also in terms of the uh, washings, um, for sure it's a good alternative and we continue in this direction. Okay, so um, now I can come back to you, Dietrich. So what, is, what are your challenges when we say, okay, on one hand there's pollution because of the washing, the dyeing, and your, uh, with, with organic cotton, so there's the fiber. So what is your aim personally for your brand? So you say, okay, ours is the fiber itself, and what issues are you working on other than that? I mean, the aim of Good Society is definitely a ecologic approach. I mean, we have this uh, uh, arguments we know since the 70s. Everyone knows that this is born out of the 60s, of the first oil crisis, uh, the, the wood dying in Germany. We have, we have this, like, it's part of our education in school to be sensible for nature. And this is especially a very German uh, uh, story, which I really hope will influence on a worldwide scale. Um, this is one part. But once you think about nature, you are very quick, and this is what uh, Patrick said before, you will very quickly think about humans, about people. And then we need to think about how we want to build our 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 global society. We are a global society, we, and it has a lot of positive aspects, but we need to understand that there are people everywhere who wants to eat, who wants to have education, and needs to have education to be fine in our societies and out of societies. Then skip all the ecological arguments, which I guess are resolvable. I mean, I would be very interested to know from you how you think how this type of organic, what you say is organic, which I totally believe in you, and as said, one of the biggest any manufacturers of fabric in the world said the same to me. We believe in GOTS, which for us is the best standard, which guarantees the best thing. How many years do you think we will take to make it work? I mean, we have in Germany today 65% of organic uh, agriculture. In Austria, 80%. There is, is a way to do it. We may not have the time of t for 20 or 30 years to do it because we know global warming things happening. We may be quicker. We hope we can make it. And um, but um, your, your question: We just believe that there should be more balance, and we should be aware about that. We are all together here in one planet, in one world. We come from the same thing, and we can live together. And uh, and that goes through various passages. This is not only the ecologic part, it's a part of how do we in future will create economy? What is cooperation? What is community? And where everyone sits in one boat, and there's not one who has everything, or a group who has everything, others have nothing. Even if we know that things getting better on a worldwide scale, but it's not accept acceptable anymore. And this is one of our, our ideas to inspire every fashion brand to move into this direction, because fashion is very strong and can change it. Mm. So you want to hand over the question to, to Patrick, uh, how yes, long it will take? I would be really uh, yeah? like to know how... Can you answer what the question? He says, <laughs> if he, as a pioneer, uh -huh. feels how we can make that work and we need to compromise close need to say okay we can't do our our line in organic and maybe we have to say okay come on guys uh, we need to use a little bit of conventional cotton we do the clean washes we do this is all good here but we don't have the resources now this is very honest and everyone can live with it instead of starting a war no we can always start a war i want everything you know i pay you more no bruno you have smart indigo no i buy all your production no? <laughs> so everyone uh, I have it only one, so we, we should stop with that. We should understand that we're all in one boat. But Could you answer? Organic. You want to try? <laughs> Where's your glass? Um, I, had, I, had, <laughs> I, had, I had a few years ago, a few years, 20 years ago, a vision. I thought uh, I was sitting by a field, and the field was smelling really 
fruitfully. Yes, it was really good smell, and then uh, I had a beer in front of me, and uh, the sun was setting down, and I had a vision, and I said, oh, I want to make it 100, 10, 2. 100 was for 100,000 farmers. 10, 100, again, it's 100,000 farmers. 100,000 farmers. 10 was in 10 years, double income. Okay. 100 I never managed. <laughs> 10 years I didn't manage, and double income I only managed in Tanzania. But the question is, the demand of the market is a different demand than the demand of the agriculture, which makes that there are two, two conflicting parties there. The market wants a quick and easy system, and organic agriculture is taking care of nature, talking to nature, if, if, you, if you understand how I mean it, you know, the, talking to nature, uh, interacting with nature, and, and letting the, the um, biodiversity really make the work and not the pesticides. And this takes a lot of time. And therefore, to make organic, genuine, genuine, genuine organic agriculture is nothing you can do quickly. Mm. And genuine organic agriculture means you have to enter into a relation with the farmer, and that cannot be a biased relation, that has to be a continuous relation. Because the farmer needs your security to build up his field over these years. Which means, I'm telling you, a quick business, or that, let's say all these big retailers who came and did it quickly, I'm sorry, they disturbed, they disturbed the real build-up of organic agriculture. And uh, today we are really struggling, we are really struggling because we have to prove that this agriculture is organic, and at the end, this is costing more than the premiums we are giving to the farmers. Mm. Yeah, right. Yeah, you want to say here again, <laughs> Dietrich? I'm very sure about that. If we say that part of this world uh, getting cheaper has made the world be more bad, we definitely won't pay the same price for when the world should get better. Mm -hmm. So we understand that every product needs to have a value. And you always say, and I, I understand, you said industry is demanding huge quantities. We won't be able also to live maybe with this huge quantities we consume now, but maybe we can live with one piece, which has an artisan uh, uh, background, which is done by the people, which we can feel, we can see somehow in a digital world, which are part of what we wear, as it has been not so long, not so long time ago here. We went to buy our food, our uh, vegetables, our fruits from the farmers in Hamburg. I mean, <laughs> from the French same town. So for us, for my in my childhood, it was normal. So and I guess we can change this. We don't need this huge quantities. We need better quantities. We need better stuff. And look, you you have a this this trouser is original. It has its spirit. So you may not need every day a new one or next week one. But we know we all understand we have a generation which moves into that direction. And, but I don't know always if they're really so full of understanding what, what happiness with a peace can be. And I guess we can change it in this direction too. But I would like to, how you think, how you think consumption will move on in future? Because it's a question to a premium high brand as you have, how you think about introducing, yeah. You need to have quantity, sure but maybe not so much as Primark or other people, but <laughs> uh, yeah. And yeah, you have a, a, a higher number, so how can you, as a, a big brand, you're... No, I think that's a very good, uh, very good point. Um, we need um, products that have a, a longer lasting uh, lifetime, because um, I think this um, like, um, super fast fashion is um, really not the concept for the future. It, it can't, it just can't be. So um, when it comes to my personal choice, it would always be uh, unwashed war, raw jeans. Um, they, 
I mean, I've got some jeans on my cupboard that are 15, 20 years old, and they are, I can still wear them. And I think that should be um, something that uh, we should also um, bring to the customer. And um, also, we as a brand should um, work on um, the quality level of the products, even though, of course, not every jeans in our collection can be uh, raw jeans, but we can make sure that we uh, offer the best quality um, and, the, for example, the stitching yarns um, to really make the jeans last as long as possible. And I think this is something, uh, beside all the other aspects we heard today, um, we should um, yeah, really um, teach our customer in this direction as well. And I think this is exactly what uh, what you are doing, no? Yeah, and, the, the uh, swapping, that was, I was going to yeah. say that. But before we dive into the swapping, because Patrick Duffy knows all about if the, the 20-year-old jeans are the ones that they're the hot <laughs> ones that everybody wants. But uh, to just wrap up the, that conversation, I just want finally um, at the end to talk to Bruno once again uh, about one, one thing in the last year's the Greenpeace campaign has driven a lot of change, um, especially in denim sex extra complex and thirsty supply chains. Additionally, there are the topics of sandblasting, chemicals, and the extensive uh, water usage um, and pollution. Now, technology from Gianologi, Gia, Gianologia, oh my god, my Italian is so bad, <laughs> is finally, yeah, <laughs> is finally spreading deeper into supply chains. What's next? Well, I already mentioned it, uh, unfortunately, before. Um, I think that um, uh, our ongoing process to, in the research to find alternatives for toxic chemicals uh, was, in the first place, um, the finding of um, natural polymers that could substitute these toxic chemicals. And that is something that we are doing now since six years, more or less. And that was already a huge step because uh, using uh, uh, natural polymers that substitute chemicals that come from petrol or that, um, uh, for instance, there's one big problem also that everybody uh, knows about is the microplastic. Microplastic is everywhere available and cannot be filtered anywhere. And if you consider that every year we make 10, million, uh, 10 billion pants of jeans and that they all need to be washed at least once the first time in that process everything that you put on the fabric is coming out and can, is not filtered at all so if you start with a raw jean and you wash it at home or also the first time in the laundry some things can just not be filtered out but we what we did is we looked for alternatives not to use them at all because if you don't you don't need bad chemicals to make a nice gene. That's the, the big message. And so in the first step, we did all this research on natural polymers to substitute plastics and things like that, or uh, additives that came from petrol and whatever, um, that you all don't need really. And uh, the next big step though, the revolution in our uh, plant was, uh, as a matter of fact, what I said before, is the smart indigo. Is where we found out with partners that you can change the molecule of indigo with um, electricity and uh, not with chemistry. Because to make every pair of jeans, you need a lot of indigo. And the indigo is always uh, transferred in with chemicals to be able to dye. So once you find the solution also for that, that's here we're really talking about big revolution mm. because that uh, skips out tons and tons and tons of um, really bad, bad chemistry. Mm. Yeah. So, um, and this is again uh, one step ahead in the, in the continuous research to, to look where we can improve. Um, the next thing we do, for instance, now is also, um, we're not very fond, uh, just like other people also, of certifications, but something um, needs to be there to to show that you're transparent. And we are, for instance, working with the cradle to cradle now also to, to have a, somehow a hold of a system that looks for where you can improve. Because cradle to cradle is just 
stimulating you, and also detox is the same. It stimulates you to find solutions for something. Not everything can be solved tomorrow. That's what we said, what we say continuously. But at least if you're pushed into the research for alternatives, then it comes. It's, it is possible looking into other fields and things like that, uh, like these natural polymers we found in the medical world. But if you're not used to look into the, these worlds in laboratories that work with the medical world, then you will not find. So you really have, we have to do something more, and which is of course also a cost factor then, but that's our challenge and certainly in Europe, not only in Germany, but in Europe, uh, all over the place where still these things are made, uh, we are more expensive than whatever, Bangladesh jeans or whatever, mm -hmm. but we have a reason to be more expensive also. It's the fact that we are, but also the fact that we are pushed to be better to compete in this global world is that we find, we need to find something new. And the easy thing uh, to make new constructions and things like that, that's all done. We have seen everything in the last 50 years everywhere. But the real challenge is to make add, real added value to get uh, to come to a better world, a better living for everybody in the world. Because let's not forget that we are making something for the happy few. Our products are not more expensive than uh, if it would come from Germany or if it would come from Spain. It's all the same level. Uh, you, we're talking about European level. This cannot be compared with uh, Far East level. but. Um, that's where we need to, to be different and uh, um, without being more expensive. So uh, the real added value is there and can be transmitted also out of Europe. Mm. But we need this drive from everybody and that's what we try to say to everybody. We don't want to be the best animal of the world or the biggest one. We want to uh, be transparent and uh, transmit the um, the message that there is technology available to give a benefit for the whole world because that's at the end what we all need. So we don't want to make something for the happy few. We really want to give a message to distribute this technology all over the world um, to get the benefit for everybody. And, and make a good product and a sustainable product and a jeans, like you said, that has a good quality and stay for years. And uh, we don't need to buy so many uh, jeans. Uh, the average American buys four pairs of jeans every year. When was the last time, Patrick, you bought one? Oh, the, the microphone. <laughs> four years ago. Four, year, four years ago was the last time I ever bought clothes. Oh, you, uh, really? Yeah. You don't tell those people. I know, I'm like they're, <laughs> the nasty. <laughs> You're the nasty don't, one. No, no. But we collaborate, we collaborate. <laughs> no, but the last time I bought clothes was four years ago because, of course, I kind of had a, uh, as Oprah likes to say, an aha moment, and I realized that cons we were, we've been trained for um, obsolescence in clothing, and we've been trained for overconsumption, and that's what inspired me to start my clothes swap project, and so I just took a pledge to not buy clothes. The only thing I bought were sh was shoes, but everything else has been swapped or is, um, has been gifted or, yeah, pretty much swapped. So, so let's talk about your project, your swapping project, because we've talked about technologies and fibers. So um, let's yeah. forget about uh, the production and go, what's swap, what, what is your work? What's swapping? <laughs> what's Can I just make one comment? Yes. Before we, I'm but, sorry not to include no, you. That's you could okay. have said, I want to say something. That's okay. <laughs> you didn't want to be rude. brilliant men on stage. I was like, they got it. They got <laughs> it. But it's an interesting, an audience interaction moment, if you, if you don't mind. So uh, we believe that the power, um, and I'm sure these people believe too, I hope so, sorry, sorry. Um, that the power is in your choice, the power is in your pocketbook. So I just like a quick exercise. How many of you, raise your hand, own denim? You raise your hand. Ooh, I would say 99% or do it the other way around. Okay, yeah. The one person that doesn't own a pair of jeans, please stand up. <laughs> Somebody doesn't have a Does pair of jeans. Does anybody not own denim? Okay. So, 100%. Interesting, so let's just for all intensive purposes. <laughs> How do you like that? <laughs> what, do you not own denim? <laughs> Never mind. Um, okay, so then this, is, this proves my point. So the power of making change comes with the power of your pocketbook. So um, I would just wanted to make the point that the power of changing the industry actually lies within you. So the, the choice that we have to make to purchase sustainably, slowing our consumption habits down is right here. So we all have a 100% uh, part to play in that. So I was just curious. Okay, so let's talk about the swapping events. The swapping, okay. Just shortly. Thank you for participating. Yeah. <laughs>
sum up what uh, this event looks like. What can you do at your event? Sure. So we started clothing swaps. Um, it just kind of. So I have a I have a marketing and a hospitality background, and so doing events and planning events and uh, working with big luxury fashion brands and brands like H and M and Topshop has always been has been a part of my DNA. So I was doing entertainment around those fashion brands in order to sell them. So one day I had that aha moment when I saw the Rana Plaza collapse, which was I'm sure many of you know, but just to quickly refresh, it was the factory that collapsed in Bangladesh that killed more than 1,000, I think 1,134 1, workers and affected the lives of thousands. So that moment collapsed my soul and what I re and I realized what can I do um, I, I didn't know what I could do to to, to change that or, or to augment my own path until one day I actually walked into a clothing swap and saw pandemonium amongst the people in a swap happening and I realized ah this this can actually be an amazing tool for communication but how are we going to do this so Using my little cauldron of you know magic and spices, I basically took the idea of a clothing. I'm not a witch. I took the <laughs> I took the idea of clothing swap and basically branded it and turned it into a tool for consumers to be able to learn, understand, and collaborate together on how to be more sustainable in the fashion industry. So we also actually collaborate with brands. So I'm not the devil. Um, what we <laughs> what I've actually <laughs> I, to, I have all their phone numbers. So if you want to talk, perfect. <laughs> contrary to popular belief, for what you see on Instagram. So the thing is, is we um, what a swap looks like to answer your question. It's very simple. So, as I said, 100% of you uh, uh, not only own denim, but you own clothes. Because I see, you know, most of you are, or all of you are, clothed, not naked. So all of you own clothes. Which what we what we identify clothing is as currency. So that currency you bring into a clothing swap. So you bring yours, 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 yours. And basically what we do is we have a one to one system. So you bring five items, I bring three, you bring two, you bring ten, and we turn that into a currency. So you're able to actually swap. And what the, uh, uh, you 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 can swap with your your friends. So what that does is it it, uh, it teaches people to slow down consumption. It shows people that you don't need to actually go out and buy more and consume more. So for us, it's a very subtle teaching tool to show people that you don't need to subscribe to the fast fashion model and to what these gentlemen were saying before. Quality, which I really love that you said that, is what we need to understand. So it, it's a retraining process, but done in a really fun and exciting way. So around that, how we've, po how we've popularized that is we've inclu uh, included culture. So we, ha we work with various musicians, various artists, um, different people in and around um, the fashion industry who become our ambassadors. That, um, and uh, did I say something? <laughs> 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 I'm not the devil. No, I'm kidding. He wants to swap the jeans. Oh, he's going to swap <laughs> jeans with me. That's what's going to happen. So <laughs> Anyways, um, so yeah, so that's how we do it, and we, you know, we work in very small, um, you know, w with groups of like 30 people in a in a home. We've I've taken over the um, Madison uh, Square Madison, Garden. Madison Square Garden. We did one there. We did a on the you know basketball floor. We did one at Federation Plaza in, in Melbourne, Australia. We did one in collaboration uh, recently in Portugal at the CCB. So we do rather large locations, um, but then not everybody can get to them. So we've created a toolkit which is open source, and I was talking to you about this before because the idea of how it's about messaging for us and really about what do you need to do as a consumer to make that change? You shouldn't have to come to a swapping event, but we encourage people to do them on their own. So we created this open source toolkit, which is very simple, and it basically just, you're back. It's <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> we're going to swap jeans. I'm kidding. Anyway, so, um, so it's very simple. So basically what we, you know, we, we encourage people to do is to download this cool toolkit and then, and then do it in their own communities. And, and, and how important is uh, denim? Is, is like denim the, the big cur the currency or how do you rate denim? Well, to relate back to that, I guess I should have timed my question differently, but the question, if we all had our hands raised again, denim yeah. is so important. I mean, all of us have denim on here. We're going to find one for you. We're going to find you. We'll find you. We'll so find we're all, we, you know. Downstairs is a whole. And <laughs> denim, yeah. <laughs> And you know, it's a, denim has a is a love story with denim. It started it out as a utilitarian item that was um, popularized, and now every major fashion brand in the world uses it, from couture down to fast fashion. There's an incredible story. And what I was talking, what you know, the question I was asked uh, that I asked before, it is extremely powerful because if you choose the right the denim that has the right. Um, making it has the right, um, uh, uh, it ha not the right. It has the. Um, it's made with um, proper ethics, and it's done in the right way. Then you, as a consumer, can tell the story through denim. So it's extremely important. So maybe let's ask in the round. How do you like the idea of swapping? Is uh, 
what do you think is the devil or is there something you can say oh no we can no I, when when i um i mean uh, I, i knew that you are doing these events but you explained me a little bit more just uh, minutes ago and i think it's really a um, great opportunity to get new clothing to get a new look to really um think about your wardrobe um i mean before you go there you choose um i haven't maybe put that on for a year so I bring it with me and I guess um, you get uh, uh, definitely a different relationship to the clothing you, you take with you because you know that there has been a uh, um, history behind that especially denim I mean that tells really stories of a lifetime and um, I love this idea so maybe I join you and yeah yeah I do one in Hamburg yeah 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 um, so we actually not just do swapping. So how we collaborate with brands is we created a recycling program. Mm -hmm. So we do consulting with GFX. We started as a clothing swap and now we're a global communications platform and we create strategy for big brands now. And that's how we've evolved. But swapping is the core. So how we work with big brands is we, w we encourage people in stores like H&M or wherever to recycle their clothing. So again, showing, and we do those through clothing swaps. And so we actually have collaborated with the fashion industry. So at first, when I was knocking, exactly, <laughs> yeah, and small brands too. But what first, when I was knocking on the doors of these brands, they were like, no way. Like, uh -huh. you are not doing this. But now, it's like... The clothes stink. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, we all have those. We're prejudiced. Exactly. But now, it's been an amazing, uh, beautiful collaboration story. So, Because I'm, I'm really curious what you think of swapping and, and uh, been in the textile industry for so long. <laughs> you, you, will be, you will be very much amazed. Excuse me? What? You will be very much amazed. Yes, yes. I think swapping would be a very good idea to reduce the second-hand closing to Africa. Yeah, good. Absolutely. Um, yes, I think it's a great idea. I mean, I see also young people, they meet every, every week and they interchange clothes. So I guess it's a good idea. And just to give you two numbers, 54% of trousers sold in Germany are denim, are jeans. And in to your project, like for 2023, it's foreseen that more the vintage market will be bigger than the market of new bought clothes. Wow. So this is already, it goes into that direction. And um, one thing what Bruno has not, what is very important to say, what their company has done something which closes the loop of detox. So... What they have done, they close really a loop, and it's there already, and we just hope that it goes uh, faster, uh, and the manufacturer is able to make these machines, because they have one, and in the world, as existing 3,000, so also there will be a compromise. And one of the major, for us, sustainable uh, 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 brands which are around, uh, or which try to move into that direction like Close is doing, they already understand that they have to go that direction. But you maybe want to say something to it. Yeah. Well, just one thing about uh, your project. I didn't know about that, unfortunately. But I think uh, I'm, I'm very enthusiastic about that because I think that uh, what we need to do generally in the world is also change the mindset of the buyer because um, what probably a lot of people don't know is that there is a huge overproduction in the first place, uh, especially uh, maybe not from small brands because they have everything uh, under control, but the bigger you get, uh, the more difficult it, uh, it is. And then there's the pressure of the market, the merchandises, the prices, the margins, everything is so complicated. And that's where a lot of overproduction is created and this, if we can change, change slightly that mindset, then probably this will also help in trying to go into organic cotton, for instance, in the future. Because we can, we just said, I mean, if, if organic cotton is now 1%, and if now tomorrow everybody wants to have organ, organic cotton, it's just not possible. But if we want to arrive there, at least in a decent time, like five years, ten years, whatever, then slowly um, there needs to be done something also from the industry about that overproduction because there's too much stuff done for nothing. Yeah. And this is a huge problem that nobody talks about. But, and already if you read, I mean, we, we're talking about something like 25%. 25% of the clothing produced is not used. 
Oh, wow. Yeah. And this is amazing. So, um, and people don't wear it, or they wear it three or four times, and then they throw it away? Exactly. exactly. Yeah, I mean, if you calculate, I said before, also another number, 10 billion pairs of jeans. We're 7 billion people in the world, but not all of them can buy the, the, the jeans. So if you calculate that back, that would mean normally that every single person buys himself five jeans per year, which is just not possible. Yeah. No, but even we guys, we the purists, we, we, even we don't do that. So, I mean, that's that's a huge problem, really. So, yeah. I hand it over to uh, to Patrick again. And I read that in China's Xinjiang province, for example, 300 million pairs of jeans are made annually. I mean, 300 million pairs. <laughs> Really? That's a lot. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's a lot. Um, what, the other thing that we have not really touched on is the waste factor. Yeah. And so that's one of the things that we really focus on too with GFX is about textile waste, which is a shocking, shocking, shocking amount that goes into landfills every year. I think it's 110 million tons in the United States every year, which is unbelievable. And so, you know, we have to think about, like you said, closing the loop. It is so important about, like I said in the beginning, the, we're trained for planned obsolescence, that that's okay. That's not okay. We're trained that throwing things, throwing your textiles in the garbage is okay. That's not okay. So I think that what these guys are doing, we have to, is incredible. We do have to collaborate, but what it comes down to is a change of mindset. And so I definitely hope for, I hope we can. So, yeah. And um, I think what would also help a lot if um, we, we just had the topic of certifications early on. And um, I think there are far too many different certifications when it comes to sustainable clothing. And it would really be a big help for not just uh, us as a brand, but also for the consumer if there would be... A, just one system, I could imagine like a rating system where you have like a traffic light um, scale or something like that, just to make it really easy to understand because at the moment, I don't know how many certifications there are around and you need to be, I don't know, you study uh, fashion to really understand what is the right um, certification, what, what does it stand for and I think that would be really a big help if the industry would sit together and really work on something like that. So. Yeah, I sure. always say my, my daughter is 11 years old and she's just, uh, fashion is the new thing. She wants to buy from her pocket money. So, so how am I going to uh, explain all those uh, standards to my daughter? She's, I want the pair of jeans. And so that, that's really, but as we're uh, approaching the final moments, I would like to wrap it up a little bit and ask each of you like a question. What do you think, where will the future of uh, denim happen? So. Well, starting with you, yeah, the future of, future of denim and, and where will it be most sustainable? The future of denim and where it will mo be most sustainable. Yeah, what you do you... You do ask the tough question. Yeah, I do. <laughs> future of denim, where it, will be, where it will be most sustainable. Yeah, what do you think? I don't know. I mean, it's well, such Well, shopping, a, you can say, my, go. go yeah, I mean, I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to have to, it's going to have to shape up. It's going to have to fix itself because, like you, what they're talking about, this one percent of water, like the resources are just drying up. So we're going to have to really have to change it. I think buying for longevity. I think buying less than five, you know, jeans a year or swapping, um, and really, <laughs> you know, rethinking what that looks like. And I, I think if you're going to buy something, know the transparency, know what you're buying, know what you're putting on your body. I'd just like to give a quick shout out to Fashion Revolution and their amazing transparency index, so you can see where brands. Say that again, slow. Fashion Revolution. <laughs> Fashion Revolution is an amazing global organization. I'm sure you guys know it. They have a transparency index that's open source, so you can see where brands sit and um, how they're doing. So I'll pass this over, but um, just know what you're buying and, and be proud of it. Okay. I think um, it's about technology and new innovation, especially in terms of the fibers, because uh, it's something I just learned uh, recently uh, during the last year, uh, to be honest, how um, water, energy, uh, and, and also land consumption, uh, the, the cotton growing is. And um, we, we had that like uh, uh, just uh, uh, in the beginning of the talk. Um, I think and I see that there's so much happening and you said that as well that there are uh, the techniques um, are so fast developing and I think this is the future and I think we are just at the very beginning and uh, we're going to see some really amazing stuff happening in the next five to ten years. I'm, I'm quite sure about that. 
When, when, when I started 30 years ago, everybody was saying, that's gimmick, what you're trying to do. <laughs> and um, I simply didn't talk anymore to people, and I did it. And I think uh, today I'm, I'm fascinated about the, the, the know-how which I can hear here. And I think I'm, I'm retired now. I've, I've got nothing anymore to do. But <laughs> I think what, what has to come in now is that, that forces join hands and get this idea going. And I think this is the key point. And, and you cannot get everything going. You just every year you put one priority down and you try to solve it. I think this is the key. Um, I mean, denim for us stands just for one thing. I mean, we started to do denim because denim is the most worn garment in the world. Uh, and it's the most emotion loaded. It's kind of a cigarette where you say, okay, there's an image behind what, who you are when you wear this stuff. So we try to load our brand with the values we do, like ecological, social. I mean, part of our company is also to support groups which aren't so lucky as we being born here and having all the opportunities. Um, denim just stands for one thing. I don't think it's so difficult to change the industry. I mean, we, we discussed it. But it's not only the denim industry, and uh, it's every industry which should care about conscious, be conscious in what we do. And I, I guess it's a very important argument. We can have 10 certificates. Uh, I guess we need also the governments to, be, to make sure that what is here in our stores is done without uh, unfair work practices, without harmful chemicals. Uh, that will be a part and then we don't need so much certificates anymore. When we buy a piece of meat, which we had 10 years, a huge problem in, 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 in Europe, today we know it won't work. Uh, it, it will not be like this. In future, uh, we should have the same securities uh, in fashion and in every industry. Okay, then uh, it's probably up to me to end with a positive note. <laughs> oh, um, I like that. Uh, I think that um, we just said it before in the beginning that we are on this topic since 12 years now, since 2007. And we do feel though that in the last two years, there is an excel incredible acceleration in the mindset, in the changing of the mindset. Um, all the big brands have been, in big, uh, have been put in big difficulties due to the fast fashion, but exactly there they can find the good alternative to be still um, uh, good and uh, um, a reason to be in Europe and that's what exactly is happening. So big, big brands are coming back into the market, pushing really very hard on all these topics, on organic cotton, on cradle to cradle, whatever, certifications or commitments because again, certifications, there's probably too many of them. We love more the idea of a commitment, just like the detox is a commitment, it's not a certification. So you exchange information, and that's what exactly we do too now. We don't sell simply collections of denim anymore, we sell technology because we do wanna get this technology out of our company only. And of course, that's because we really do believe that it needs to be a benefit for everybody. So if we have to sell our technology one day elsewhere, because like Dietrich said before, with some of the technologies, we are the only ones. But this, we, we opened ourselves also up. In the uh, beginning, we were a little bit more like, this is ours and nobody can see. But that's, that's old fashioned. This is not from today anymore. So we really need to bring be this transparent. out. Absolutely. And, and that's the, the big yeah. thing. You need to be transparent. Yeah. So exactly. I really like all your answers saying the mindset has to change. Uh, consciousness, awareness, new technologies, social responsibilities, and a pair of jeans coming from the co -work, from the workers' uniform image. You know, they can stay a lifetime. So uh, this, is, uh, this was our uh, panel discussion uh, on how Denon can become a leading fashion change maker. And we talked about the problems um, of the Denon production, learned about solutions, and we've heard some visions for the futures, which I really liked. And uh, thank you very much for coming here. Thank you for your input. And uh, that was it. Thank you very much. Thank you.